Blog Talk Radio. Hi, welcome to Conservatives Cool Talk Radio. This is your host, Wayne Bradley. We're here on Fix Michigan Mondays. I want to thank everybody that's listening out there. Uh, tonight we're going to talk to a few people uh, discussing the issues on what we can do to fix Michigan and obviously some of the things we can do to fix this country of ours because we definitely uh, definitely need some help here. Um, my guest tonight will be David Oliviencia, who is the chairman of the Michigan Republican Hispanic Association. I'm waiting for him to give me a call in now, and I believe that's him. And we also have the uh, Senate Majority Leader Mike Bishop on the show tonight. So uh, let me take the first call. I believe this is David. Hey, David. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is Wayne. Uh, this is David Wayne. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. How you doing? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Great. Thanks for calling in. Just so I can uh, introduce everybody, this is David Oliviencia, the chairman of the Michigan Republic Hispanic Association. Thank you for coming on tonight. Oh, it's great, great to be on, Wayne. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, we've we've met at a few different events, and I want to say thank you on the air again for all, inviting me to all the meet and greets because um, it's been a great opportunity uh, to meet uh, some of the GOP candidates running for uh, governor. And um, I just wanted you to come on the show tonight and kind of give us a little background about the uh, the about your organization, and uh, we're gonna you know talk about what we can do here to fix Michigan. Sure. How long have you been chairman of the um, of the Michigan Republican Hispanic Association? Uh, yeah, it's been about about three years, three three and a half years or so. Um, I've been chair, chairing the organization. Uh, the, the official name is the, the Michigan Republican National Hispanic Assembly. Uh, okay. it's, you know, it's kind of a long it's kind of a long name, but uh, but uh, was really founded by um, George H W Bush uh, maybe 20 25 years ago, um, as uh, you know the, they were the leadership of the Republican Party was looking at you know, our great country and uh, l- looking at demographic shifts. Uh, and the rise of the, the growing Hispanic community um, wanted to create a, an entity that would really help uh, the Republican Party engage with the Hispanic community, uh, but also vice versa, help the Hispanic community voice their concerns and, and connect in, in, into the Republican Party uh, to help shape policy, et cetera. So um, there's, there's uh, maybe 10 to 15 or so state chapters ac- across uh, the United States uh, some some uh, been around longer than others, but um, you know Michigan has been around uh, maybe 15 years or so. Um, one of the founding members, uh, Francisco Pancho Vega, from the west side of the state of Michigan, actually was one of the founding members of the, the RNHA uh, nationally, and. Uh, you know, has been has been involved throughout, and, and the chapter here in Michigan's, uh, you know, been through um, uh, different turns and, and different leaders, and, and I've been, uh, you know, kind of blessed to lead lead the last uh, three years or so. <clears throat> what do you? What are some of the programs or some of the uh, outreaches that you do to get, obviously, to get more people involved and to make people more aware of the organization? Yeah. So, you know, we we. Um, you know we're we're volunteers, and uh, you know the big the big thing that we've been doing I think is is really the, a meet meet and greet events. So we we the last several years we've had uh, meet and greet events with um, congressmen uh, to gu- gubernatorial candidates uh, to just lead, you know just general leaders in the party, and really giving uh, the community an opportunity to. Um, you know, listen to the, listen to these great leaders. Understand some of the things that they're working on. Uh, learn a little bit about. Learn more about Washington D.C. or learn right. more about Michigan. Um, but in addition to that, I think you know, also uh, share their perspective on issues that are that are important to them, right. to the community, uh, etc. You know, you know, Wayne. I mean. You know, one of the reasons I, I got involved in this, you know, I you know I grew up on the the south side of Chicago, okay, and um, you know, you can, as you can probably tell from my Tennessee accent, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, in growing up there, I was you know I was always told that um, you know the Republican Party was for the was for the rich and the well off, 
right. and the uh, the Democratic Party was was for those who who were poor and, and middle class, right? Right. And uh, you know, I think you know, and, and as I've you know, and as I've kind of grown up and learned a little bit more and and uh, uh, and, and just really studied, you know politics and policy and, and what makes good states and what makes good countries and, and what has really made America great over the years, right? I mean, I think, uh, you know, I've just, I've tended to, you know, learn and, and lean more towards more conservative principles um, and, and and really work on it. Just edu- educate, I think having two parties is great. Right. Uh, Mitt family are Democrat. And we have great, interesting debates, and I think they're both needed. And I don't think our Republican Party is perfect by any by any means. But um, you know, my job I think is really just you know let's let's op- let's have the issues, let's talk about them, let's make sure we we all understand both sides of the issues. And I think it's important that you know we get out there and and and, and vote. I mean, I think just simple things like un- you know, just understand understand the issues, understand candidates' positions on issues, and get out there and get active and vote. Because we, I mean, we all have a, have the obligation, I believe, right. to make this country better for for our kids. And I'm a father of three. And Wayne, I know you're a father, and and I think we, you know, we have to make this place better for, for them and 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 leave a better country than we were given. I, I totally agree. Um, why do you, you know, this is just from what my experience has been so far. Why do you think that uh, the Hispanic community identifies better with the Republican Party? Uh, than to say for with the African American community, Why, what do you see the connections a little bit better? Yeah, you know, I, you know, I think um, you know, I always I think there's several things that I think t- tie the two together: the Hispanic community and the Republican par- uh, Party. You know, I think our faith and our, our Christian faith, uh, Judeo Christian faith, is one thing that I think both both uh, the Hispanic community and the Republican Party I think hold hold deeply. Um, I think uh, our families. Right? I think one of the, you know, I think we all care about our families. And you, you look at any major park on a weekend, and you'll see all kinds of Hispanic families out there, you know, celebrating birthdays and and, and eating great food, etc. But I think families are something that I find both both um, the Hispanic community, and the Republican Party, to to really care deeply about. Um, free enterprise. And, and really, the the you know the business environment and the amount of you know you look at the fastest growing businesses in America and they're Hispanic owned businesses and, and within that are are, are, are Latina or female owned uh, Hispanic businesses are really the the the, 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 the tremendous growth within the United States and that's you know you look at the power of our economic engine and it's small business and, right. and so really they get all the the things that are around lower taxes, lower regulation, the things that can help their business go. So I think there's a, there's a f- affiliation there. Uh, the third is uh, the other one is freedom, and whether it's you know, Hispanics that serve in our military, uh, some that have died for this country, who who frankly are not citizens and and are have, have fought for our country, not being a citizen but believe in what we stand for, um, right. as well as when when you lose freedom, and this is the key, this is key, Wayne. When when you when you when you're, for example, from from Cuba, and you lose your freedom, and you come to this country with nothing on your back, you know, with nothing but but maybe a maybe a bag, um, you have a true appreciation for what freedom is and what getting it taken away from you really means. Right. I think I think that's one thing. That I think. Um, are, a lot of uh, the, the Hispanic community, particularly the Cuban Cuban Americans within the Hispanic community, I think really really know and understand why they they love this country and why they do everything they can to protect freedom. Um, you know, the last one I, I say is fiesta, right? I mean, I think, I think the Republican Party, you know, loves to have a good time, loves to celebrate, loves to celebrate the great things this country stands for. And I think the you know our our Hispanic community here uh, loves to do the same thing. And I think you know I, I think throughout this nation's great great history, um, you know the Hispanic community has contributed in, in many different ways throughout wars, uh, throughout uh, you know, educational uh, achievements, uh, etc. So those are just some of the ways what you know how how I how I think the, the two you know and I, but I think a lot of those. 
you know, when we look at the African American community, I, mean, I think there's a lot of similarities there too as well. Um, when you look at the Republican Party and, and uh, you look at uh, Abraham Lincoln and, and what we did around uh, slavery, um, you know, you look you look at uh, uh, you know some of the early founders of the Republican Party, you know, Frederick Douglass. Um, right. And I, you know, I think it's, it's. I don't think it's. You know, you look at faith and family. I mean, I think those are very similar in both the, the Hispanic community, African American community, freedom and military. I mean, you can go up and down the list that I mentioned, right? I mean, I think. I don't think there's that. You know, I don't think there's huge differences there. Right. Um, but Except maybe the fact that, like you said, with uh, Cuban Americans and things like that, uh, Americans in general, and I guess African Americans wouldn't be any different. We tend to take our freedom for granted. Uh, that might be one thing that when I listen to you say that, that's something that a lot of people just if you if you're from if you're from here and you don't know any better, you take your freedom for granted. I think a lot of people do that. I, I would I would agree with you, Wayne. You know, and I, and I would say that you know, I, and this is a key point, right? You know, you know, you I am first of all, I am extremely I'm an American and I'm proud to be American. Right. And this is the best country that uh, that anybody could live on. You know, regardless of how tough it is. We live in the best country in the world, in the history of the world, uh, and I'm a I'm a proud American. I'm also proud of my my Hispanic roots, uh, you know, and what what you know, the, the, being that my, my my family could come here from Puerto Rico with really minimal, but my father had a GED education, and and I've been able. This country has allowed me and my family to to, to progress. You know, up to a level that that you can you couldn't do anywhere else uh, in the world at any time in in this world's history. So you know, I, when I say Hispanic American, it's just more that I, I love the, the the you know proud of the roots that I have, but I am extremely proud to to call myself an American and and, and uh, you know very patriotic to the United States of America. Uh, I understand that. I understand that. Uh, looking out uh, and forecasting for the you know, like you said, you've been having a lot of the meet and greets. Uh, for the candidates for uh, fixing for for Michigan for the governor, have you identified anybody yet as a, a as someone you're going to be able to endorse, or are you kind of waiting waiting to uh, watch the process go a little bit further? Yeah, so so, so as chairman of the the MRNHA, you know, I, I can't endorse um, any of the candidates, but I but I think across all the races, um, I we got just a phenomenal group of leaders. Um, who I think are, are, are leaders first and foremost, which I think is, going to, is a key fact uh, in what's going to help change, change Michigan. But um, you know, I'm very I'm very bullish on on the, the, the strong group of candidates that we have and their you know their opportunity uh, to win uh, in November. Exactly, exactly. What about the uh, the attorney general race? We got, we got like, it seems like we have some good candidates even in that race also. Just to get past the GOP race, it's going to, we have some good candidates. That's true. We have two good. It sounds like you might have one one on your show here in a little bit too, huh? Yeah, we have one on a little bit later this evening. Um, and I guess the thing also I want to know have you have you uh, have you done any of the research on the fair tax? Uh, you know, we talk about a lot of things that could fix Michigan, and I guess that's one of the things I've been asking people about. Uh, how do you feel about the uh, fair tax, and do you think that'll be something that will work here in the state of Michigan? You know, I, I, so I've I've looked at the fair tax um, uh, briefly, I, and I, I mean, I, conceptually, I understand it. Um, you know, you really you you, you basically don't pay. Um, you know, all the income and all the, those other taxes go away, and basically you're hit with a hit with a sales tax. Right. Um, I, I I think it sounds good in principle, and I and I thought it sounded really good, um, but you know, I, I'm reading I'm reading the book uh, No Apologies by Romney, the case for American greatness, and I think he 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 gives he gives really not not really a, a counter he gives really a, just of something to think about as it relates to the sales, um, the fair tax, that I thought was kind of interesting. It just said that what you know, when you when you're when you're paying, uh, I can't remember the exact example, but when you're paying, you know, three or four bucks for a gallon of milk, and now you have to pay something, you know, different, or when you, uh, you know, maybe it's five bucks or six bucks, and you start looking at. Um, you know your grocery bill. You know I don't know. You know maybe it's instead of being uh, you know 200 bucks a week to now 300 bucks a week. 
does that start to now cramp your spending um, because you're not used to it? And does that have a, a potential negative effect, uh, impact on the economy? And his his book goes into a lot more detail, right? And I, I may not do I may not do it justice, but I think he he, he just has a, another perspective I think to share to share about the fair tax that I think um, I would encourage every, everybody to read the book. I find the book phenomenal, but this specific thing on fair tax, I think it's just one of the the, the areas that I think people just need to look at. Now, I, I like the concept. Um, I don't. But I think you know, but it's but it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty big shift in, in terms of the way we're doing things today. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely. And, and you you may and maybe it might make sense to and it, and I think his point is, you know, it, it would make you know on paper it makes sense, but you'd have to maybe maybe if there was a way you could get there gradually instead of just you know boom overnight. Uh, right. You know, I think that's the I think that's one of the that's one of the tricks, and then making sure that you you, you know you can manage any impacts and effects. So. Uh, so, but, but he, you know, he has a good, he has a good chapter on that. That uh, you know, I would encourage every you know, you, uh, the book itself, and then that chapter specific. Right. Have you uh, worked at all with any of the uh, tea parties here in the state of Michigan, or what's been your, what's been your feel on uh, the tea parties here in the state? You know, um, good, you know, good question. I mean, I think uh, um, so. One is I have not participated uh, in a tea party. Uh, not because I don't uh, um, believe in them, or or, um, or I guess was, I guess I don't know what what I guess constitutes an official Tea Party or, or not a Tea Party. I guess um, you know I, I uh, you know for example I've been to you know, you know meet and greets and, and various you know club events and, and all kinds of stuff, but um, but I think with the general definition is I haven't been to a specific Tea Party event. Not because um not because I don't like what they're doing or disagree with what they're doing or anything. It's actually quite the contrary. I think I think um, getting out there, voicing your opinion, um, you know, wanting smaller government, wanting the, the constitutional things that this this uh, country was founded on, and I think that's the right thing to do. I think I think it's just I think it just comes down to time and priorities for me. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know I, I I do I try to focus on the the, the mRNA chain whatever free time I have. And uh, you know what I can there. <laughs> I, and, definitely, uh, I, I definitely you know, understand that. There's a hard yeah. balance here. Yeah, um, and, and really trying to balance it all. You know, so I mean, I, you know, I, and they're and, and they're a force to be reckoned with. And I think they're they're. It's not Republican. It's not Democrat. I mean, it, it's it's really people who, you know, I mean, all the things that they've been saying. Like these are people who just care about the country and want to voice their opinion. They're using this as a as an island. I think. That's what the, that's what makes this country great, and, let, and, and I think that should continue. And people, you know, um, you can't do that in Cuba, right? You, know, you can't exactly. you, you can't you can't do that in Cuba, right? And, and I think you know I think that's what makes this country great. So I mean I I, uh, I hope to attend one one of these times, and hopefully my schedules will work out and make it convenient for me. So we'll see. We'll try, to, we'll try to get you up to one of the one of the tea parties, Dave. You'll love it. Um, I, the other the other issue we kind of talked about this earlier. Um, what's your take on the immigration policy in uh, Arizona, and what do you think that we, you know, what do you think needs to be done out there to fix that that problem out there? Yeah, um, Arizona, yeah, really bit hot hot this week. Um, so you know, I mean, if you if you think if we if if everyone puts themselves in in in, in, Ariz, in Arizona's shoes, right? I mean, I think you've got. Um, I think everybody wants a secure border, uh, and I think uh, everybody wants, um, you know, from from an uh, illegal immigrant. They want, you know, I think pausing. I think the Republican Party, right? We need to be about legal. We need to be the party that that's for legal immigration. We right. love legal immigration in this country. We love immigrants. We just love them to be legal immigrants to this country. Exactly. We also, you, what do you think? What do you think they could do to kind of fix that? Because right now, the way it sounds like they'll just be, um, you know, the, the, I guess the thing that leaves open to interpretation is that they feel like you look like you might not have, you know, you might be an illegal. So I mean, that's open to a lot of interpretation. Yeah, and that's 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 uh, you know, I don't, you know, I I don't buy, it. I don't I don't agree with it, and I don't, I don't buy it. I don't think that's the, you know, I don't think that's the right right thing to do. However. I think you've got you've got people in Arizona who are frustrated. Right. They feel like they well, got to do something. Uh, 
I think they got to right. They feel they got to get something done because the federal government's not 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 acting and not passing comprehensive immigration reform. You know, this was this was promised by the the administration to be done in the first year, right? And, and you know, by healthcare and, and and whatever that that that's got pushed off. I think now with Arizona doing this, you might have a couple other states uh, yeah, starting is. to beat on this, right? Yeah, I just saw Utah is already following suit already. Uh, today. Yeah, I mean, you could see Utah, and, and you, you know, who knows? I mean, you're gonna start, you'll start to see this catching on, right? And I think it's gonna put a lot more heat on this, um, on this debate, on, on, from a national perspective, to make something happen, right? And right. I think uh, you're starting to see the the, the, the speaker uh, and the majority, you know. Reed and, and Pelosi, I think, trying to get something moving, moving on this happening, and you're seeing interesting, interesting dynamics occurring there. But, um, but the, the bottom line is, I think you know, you got to pass something, you got to pass a, a comprehensive immigration reform at a federal level, or you're going to continue to have this stuff, right? And then, you know, you you look at the voters, Democrat and Republican in Arizona, and I think it's like, you know, the majority of them, you know, are, are comfortable with uh, with what was passed, right? Um, so you know, but you know, but I, but I, you know, I don't think I don't, you know, I think there's somebody was I think it was Juan Jones or not Juan Juan uh, Juan Williams was mentioning that um, you know, you know, in New York you have a lot of illegal Irish immigrants, right? Uh, right, and you can't, you know, who do you know who's Irish and who's not Irish and start pulling people aside and you know, you start going down a slippery slope and I don't, I don't think our country was. I don't think our four, our founding fathers wanted wanted that type of type of enforcement. It's just it's not. Right. I don't think it's the way. We gotta hope they so. they put something together soon because it's just like you said. It's gonna be it's gonna be a mess with the way things are now. I heard Reverend Al Sharpton talking about going down there just to get arrested on purpose, as if he could be mistaken for an immigrant. But I mean that's that's the whole idea is that they're gonna it's, you know it's just gonna be a mess. And I hope that, that like I said maybe the, the Republican leadership kind of steps it up and. Like you said, puts together some kind of comprehensive reform where, again, you're sensitive to families' needs and understanding what people need and as far as what, you know, there's people that have been here for a long time. But it needs to be something, I guess, put in place to keep our borders safe and also, like you said, to make, uh, you know, immigrants legal immigrants. So, Well, you know, Wayne, and this, and this is important, right? And this, this is extremely – because there's the, there's the facts of the issue and then there's just the political demagoguery – of the issue, right? And I think you know our party. Hopefully, I just hope that when, when the message really, I mean, we need to be about legal immigration. Right. We need to respect, respect the the contributions that Hispanics have made to this great, you know, Hispanics and all all immigrants, right? Um, right. That have made to this great nation, right? And we we want to make sure it's done legally. Make sure it's done legally. I think what you had last time, I and mean, you've had a lot of it. You know, a lot of anti-Hispanic rhetoric, a lot of anti-immigrant rhetoric. And right. that, 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 that's not going to, you know, we, our party will become the Whig Party, a party that that was was good for what we will, we will become extinct. Um, if we, if that's the that that's the course that we choose in this debate, our party will become extinct. Yeah, I think that they're going to really have to figure. Like I said, you got to put together some results on this. To, not uh, string it along for political gain, like you said, that that'll be a it'll be a bad thing for the party. So hopefully they don't play, you know, too too far to the right on that one. I guess is the best way to look at it. You got to you got to put something together that that works for, for the, like I said, for the people that are here, and uh, like I said, make it work. I, I don't know, like I said, the, the best way to do that yet, but I obviously uh, it has to be something that's comprehensive and covers everybody and doesn't forget about families and you know the whole nine. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, you know, I mean, you got to secure the borders. One, I think everybody agrees there. I think right. there's an element of, of of the 12 million. If you've committed a serious crime, you're, you're gone, right? I think there's an element of then then you get to the back of the line. I think there's an element of, you know, you pay a penalty, you pay your taxes, you pay back taxes. I, I right? think that would be to me financially, knowing how America works. That seems like that would make the most sense. Back taxes, you know, fees, and, and, and some kind of enrollment for people that have been here for a certain amount of time. That just seems like that's how America works. You get, you get in the back of the line because my, you know, my, uh, 
my brother-in-law, who's been waiting to come to this country now for five years, right, is still waiting, right? And and, and I think why should he have to get, you know, why should people come in be, before him and he's trying to get in, get in here legally? The right way. Yeah, you know, I mean, so... Those are, those, I mean, those are some of the things that I think, you know, that this, this that, that I think is, there are already, there's some conversations around this, but now you got to, you know, you got to start to get America ready for, 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 for this and, and let the, let the debates, you know, let the debates occur. But, you know, I think it's, you know, like you said, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's going to, you know, it's, it, I think it's going to get forced to the, whether through what Arizona, Utah is doing on one side of it. And I think what uh, the Hispanic community is doing on the others, and, and I think just America in general. You know, I mean, I think uh, so. It's I think it's gonna it's gonna get pushed to the forefront here. All right. Well, can you give everybody the website so if they want to get some more information about the organization and uh, check if they want if anyone wants to become a member, uh, could you give them the website? Sure. So uh, the Michigan one is www.mrnha.org. Uh, the, the national site is rnha. I'm sorry, www.rnha.org. Stands for the Republican National Hispanic Assembly, and then you know the M for just the, the Michigan one. Um, and, you know, there's also an event on May 28th as well that we're doing in, in Detroit, which is a. Uh, you know, it's it's always good. I think our our, our party and, and our, our political leaders need to get in more into our urban cities, so we're doing an event in Detroit. Uh, on May 28th, so hopefully those who are listening can attend, and uh, you know there's, there'll be more information, um, you know, on our Facebook site. We got a Facebook site and all that other stuff if people want more information as well. All right, I think I'm I'm supposed to do I'm doing a live show from that one, right, Dave? That is right. That is right. right. So we'll have we'll, we'll have, be promoting uh, that one up, up until that date. Then count on that. That's great, and you know we'll have Danny Vargas who who's a who's a frequent. Uh, Speaker and, and Hannity's Great American Panel will be flying in from Washington D.C. to join us. Um, several award winners, uh, some congressmen, uh, a Michigan State legislator, and a lot of people who are running for Congress will, will be there. So it, it should be it should be a great evening. Right, a great evening. I, I look forward to it. I definitely do. And we'll like I said, we'll keep the listeners updated on that up until the event. Uh, I appreciate you coming on the show tonight, and uh, I will see you at the next meet and greet. And I really do appreciate you taking time to come on the show tonight. Oh, no problem. You know, Wayne, thank you for what you're doing out there, really with the show, um, getting out there into uh, our urban communities uh, across this great country. And, uh, you know, anything I can do to help, Wayne, that's great. Thank you. Uh, you're a great American. Thank you very much, man. God bless you. You too. Have a good evening. You do the same. All right, well, I want to thank Dave again for coming on the show. Um, we talked a lot about, we usually don't go on the national issues, but I think that really that uh, we're going to, like you said, that issue of uh, immigration reform is going to be put in our face whether we like it or not. So I think that as uh, America, we need to prepare for that and accept that there's going to have to be something done. Um, and the idea, again, that like I, me as an American, I always think that we a lot of things revolve around money here. It seems like there's a lot of people here that have made money, uh, that have jobs, taxes that need to be paid. Uh, but again, you think about the people that have waited fairly. How do you deal with that? That's going to be a uh, it's going to be a very tough issue. And I hope that uh, Republicans and Democrats can work together uh, to to deal with that situation. Uh, first and foremost, they definitely need to protect the borders. Uh, I, I think there's better ways you could do it. I, I've never been, I've never thought that building the fence was a bad idea, but I assume people would always figure out a way to get around that. Uh, but we need to really look at all the things we can do to protect our borders and to, again, look at the best ways to solve the problems with immigration reform because you're going to have, um, you're going to have people from every angle that are not going to be happy with the process. So it's going to really take some uh, hashing out between all of our leaders and let's hope that no one's just playing politics uh, trying to woo voters and woo uh, uh, voting segments of the population uh, with the decisions they're making. So, uh, again, I want to thank David for coming on the show. Um, our, my next guest is uh, Senate Majority Leader uh, Mike Bishop. 
Uh, he is he has been uh, the thorn in the side of the governor for the last four years, making her uh, accountable for some of these bad deals and bad ideas they've been proposing. And uh, he's also going to be running for attorney general uh, this year in 2010. So um, it gives me bl great pleasure to uh, play the interview that I had recently with Mike Bishop. You're listening to Wayne Bradley on Fix Michigan Mondays. I have a very special guest with me tonight. Uh, the Senate Majority Leader, Mike Bishop, is on the show. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great, Wayne. Thanks for having me. Great. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. A lot of people uh, w want to hear from you. Um, I, you've, I've been told uh, by a few people that you are known as the thorn in the side of our governor up there in Michigan. <laughs> well, I've been called a lot of things, but, uh, you know, I, I don't mind being called names as long as we get the job done. Exactly. Um, I, you know, the, the name of the show is called Fix Michigan Mondays, and I always like to ask from the beginning, first of all, can you just give uh, everyone that's listening um, some background information on yourself and for the people who might not be familiar who you are, and uh, just give everyone a short synopsis of exactly who you are. Sorry. Sure. Uh, I'm a, a father of three and a husband to my wife, Christina. We live in Rochester, Michigan. I uh, was born and raised in Rochester, Michigan, in, uh, in Oak County. And I've represented that community in the House uh, for two terms, and now my second term in the Senate. Um, I'm a life attorney, and I've, I've spent most of my, my adult professional life as a uh, practicing attorney and, and prosecutor. Okay, excellent. All right, and are you? And also, right now, you're currently also in the race for attorney general, correct? That's correct. How has it? Um, how has it been? Uh, also being, you know, running for a candidate position and also actually right now having to operate as the senator of Michigan, majority leader. Well, I'm, I'm committed to my role as uh, the Senate majority leader for Michigan, and uh, it's, it's a role that is pervasive in every aspect of my life. Um, the campaign comes second, but I do believe that if I do my job right as Senate majority leader, uh, I'm campaigning at the same time because I, I think people are looking for effective, responsible um, fighters on their side. And uh, as I said, if I do my job right as Senate Majority Leader, I'm campaigning at the same time. Exactly. What, what do you think we can do, um, obviously, what do you think some of the things we can do to fix Michigan uh, to make this a better state and make people want to come back here? Well, the first thing we ought to be doing is, is send a better message. Michigan's got an awful negative message that it's emitting around the country and around the world. And the first thing we ought to do is is stop bickering with the partisanship and and just face up to the fact that Michigan has changed dramatically. Our uh, revenues are down significantly, 30% uh, general fund-wise, uh, in the past year or so. And we've got to figure out how to balance our budget and fund our programs, the core functions of government, with the money we have and not that money that we wish we had. Uh, we can't go out and tax our, our people more. It just is not an acceptable option. And uh, we've got to figure out how to be more efficient with the dollars that we have. And I, I, I think that there's a better way to run government. The Senate Republicans have put 10 different categories of reforms on the table to, to uh, make it uh, to, to make government more efficiently and, and more cost effectively, save up to $2.2 .2 billion uh, right out of the, the, uh, the function of government instead of going to the taxpayers. Would, would you say that that is uh, primarily the philosophical difference between the way you believe that uh, government should be run and, say, for the governor, who obviously is always quick to find a new tax or a new way to insert a tax on the uh, people of Michigan? Yes, I do. I, I, I really do believe that uh, you're seeing it from the federal level all the way down to the very local level, a, a huge uh, divide between the philosophies of what the function of government is. And at the state level, we now are faced with a $1.8 billion budget deficit on top of the $1.2 billion budget deficit that we closed last year. So the question is, how do you close that gap? Do you tax and close it and fill the gap with more money? Or do you find a way to, to reduce the size of government and reform government to make it uh, more efficient? And I think that divide really getting strong right now, and each side is really digging in deep for a budget battle of, uh, for 2011. Right. And uh, that, that's something that I guess people have criticized, probably both sides a little bit about, has been the budget battles and how things have been 
uh, you know, froze, you know, putting on, putting things on hold. And I, well, the thing I would wonder is, as far as doing business here in Michigan, does that doesn't that send send the wrong message to people who want to start businesses here? Then when they're seeing our our politicians battling over these sort of issues, does that also send the wrong message to businesses and make them, uh, you know, apprehensive about coming to Michigan? Yeah, I guess I need to rewind. You asked me a question about what we can do right away, and, and I said it was a negative message, and I agree with you. Yes, it sends a very negative message when partisanship takes control over any kind of uh, government environment. But the reason why I brought up the uh, the budget first when it comes to the messaging is that we can't make major changes until we first level off and get our budget under control. Right. Uh, our businesses are on, the, on, on their heels right now. They're, they're very pensive. They don't know what government's going to do from one day to the next with, in terms of regulation, state law. We've got to get things under control in state government. And then the moment we do that, we've got to turn our attention to, to the, the, the business environment and creating that environment in Michigan that fosters the growth and the, the, uh, the prosperity of the businesses that we once had in this state. And that, that was my whole point with the messaging, that we just gotta, we just got to stop uh, bickering and uh, each other's throats. And, and the way you do that is to resolve the budget price early and not draw it over the, you know, the, the October 1 deadline and shut the government down. Right. How, how is it that we're in this budget crunch and we're, we're short on funds and they're proposing a 3% state uh, raise for state employees? How does that... How does that correlate when people are hearing about these budget crunches and the, and the losses in money? How do they propose a, a, a raise at this time? How does that How does that work, and what are they thinking? Well, not only do they propose it, they have enacted it now because uh, the governor negotiated that three percent pay increase. Um, the legislature was unable; we were unable to get the uh, rejected the reject passed. It required a two thirds majority of both chambers legislature to reject the proposal. And so it's going to go into effect, and um, you know it shocks the conscience, as far as I'm concerned, that uh, that government wouldn't stare that down and immediately, immediately reject it. But it tells you a little bit about what's going on in government right now, and, and it is more of the same old philosophical divide of not being willing to step up and challenge the status quo. We've got interest groups in Michigan that run this state, and until that ends, we will never fix Michigan. How much? Um, how much are the unions affecting? Obviously, with the state state jobs, and also just overall, how much do unions play a part in making this a, a tougher environment to do some of the business, to you know, bring in new businesses and that sort of thing? Well, I, you know, we do have a negative labor in, environment uh, that you know, uh, a negative message. Uh, statewide, nationwide, worldwide, uh, there's just no question about it. And we've had battles over the years. We also have a culture in our state of over 100 years of prosperity as a result of the, the, the effectiveness of the unions. Right. So, you know, we, we created this. The, the problem is that today we have a different Michigan, and I do believe it's incumbent upon us to get together with our labor environment and to have a very uh, conscientious, uh, thorough examination of the environment here to ensure that we stop the negative, that we uh, we uh, send a message of, of wanting uh, new jobs and, and, and not one that suggests that we, we, we rather not have jobs in our state. Right. With the, uh, ha have you seen any positive effects as far as uh, being the state legislator about it with the stimulus money? Has that helped people in Michigan, and and how has it helped us if it has? I think it's, it, the stimulus money has been more of a band aid than anything else, and uh, it's effectively pushed the problem down the road. Okay. Um, I don't think it created any jobs. I do think that it effectively saved some jobs. Uh, but again, I don't believe it permanently saves anything. It uh, it it just patched us to the future. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think the the economy is recovering fast enough to 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 uh, take over when the stimulus money ends. So uh, you know we're going to have some transition here very soon where there won't be there there won't be those stimulus dollars, and Michigan is going to have to figure out. How to close gaps uh, effectively with the, without the help of the federal government? 
And, that, and I guess that's something else that we need to think about. How will this, uh, the new health care bill, how will that have an effect on uh, Michigan and its residents, and will it be an adverse effect? Well, I, I have to say that um, this health care proposal, this past health care bill, I should say, is has got a lot of <laughs> a lot of problems that I could pick apart over over the next couple of hours. But <laughs> things that one of the things that really concerns me that I don't believe was well thought out was the fact that it requires state governments to expand their current Medicaid. Right. And that. That provision alone is going to cost Michigan about another seven hundred million dollars. That, that's my understanding. Another seven hundred million dollars per year to cover that expanded Medicaid. And I, I just don't know how. I, I don't know how the states will be able to accommodate that. And um, they'll be forced to consider all kinds of revenue increases, tax increases, to try to accommodate uh, just another government spending program. Uh, now, our current attorney general, uh, he filed a lawsuit. Uh, do you agree with the lawsuit? And obviously, if you were elected attorney general, would you continue with that lawsuit? Yes to both. Um, very directly, I would say yes to both. I agree with it. I think, I think the attorney general has a responsibility to step up on behalf of the people of the state and the state itself. Um, the federal government continues, in this, especially the past year and a half, to trample upon the rights of the states and and impose upon the citizens of this state and the state itself uh, things that are, are clearly not called for in our state or federal constitution. But I do believe it's the responsibility of the attorney general to be the attorney for the citizens of the state and for the state and step up to do the right thing, and I would continue that uh, if elected. Okay. And... See here, as far as with the with as far as the education issues that we're having in Detroit, I don't know if you did you watch the uh, date Dateline on uh, NBC on Sunday night when they did the story on uh, Detroit. I did not watch it. I, I heard a lot of the uh, the comments, and I, it was unfortunate from what I understand how they portrayed the the state and the city. Yeah, it, it was pretty rough. Um, one of the bigger issues, and I think that it's not just a Detroit issue, is probably. Uh, statewide is, is education, and what would you think is the, some of the best routes in reducing government spending in schools? Obviously, with you know closings and consolidations, and do, how do you feel more about with charter schools in the, in the area? Well, I'm, I believe that we've got to we we got to find ways to give parents options. Okay. We, we cannot, it is a moral imperative that we, we stand up and fight for kids, especially in the failing school districts. It is unacceptable that we allow failing school districts to exist, and it's not fair for, for parents uh, or the children themselves to, to, to make them go to schools that are failing. And we need to challenge failing school districts with, with alternative uh, means of education. We've got all of these uh, private sector uh, Charter schools, uh, public school academies, and uh, other environments that are that are are out there that are proven effective. Uh, the key is though that we got to make sure that we we monitor those private environments as well to ensure that they're performing. And um, and I I just I believe that education is the the very basis by which we grow as a state. And if we cannot shore it up and and give children the environment they deserve to grow and learn, we will we will be uh, we'll see negative the negative impact of this for generations to come. Right. So you would be in favor, obviously, of probably raising the caps with some of these charter schools and allowing more of the competition in, in all, in, like I said, in all the failing districts. I I believe that there shouldn't be a cap at all. Okay. I I believe that there should be um, there should be some way in which we can infuse. Uh, this kind of environment in, in every community if, if necessary. You know, for example, there, in, in my district in, in the city of Rochester, for example, we've got very high-performing schools. I don't know if I would, I would opt for a charter school in, in a public school environment that is performing. Right. But if I lived in a close-by community uh, where they have a, a, um, a failing district, Detroit's not too far away, I would do everything in my, my, my power to protect my child 
and ensure they have a good learning environment. And I would, I would exercise my parental right to do that. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, I was get, going back a little bit with the uh, improving and fixing Michigan, Michigan uh, with the uh, right to work. Uh, there was an, I think it was an amendment proposed to making right to work zones. Uh, was that something that you supported, or was something you would support in the state of Michigan? I, I would support it, and I'll tell you that the, the right to work issue has become quite a contested issue over time. Um, it is really the, um, the the source of um, great angst uh, when, it, when it comes to a lot of these discussions about the future of our state. Right. But there are a lot of folks out there who are just looking for anything that we can do to change the status quo right now and challenge the state uh, by doing something dramatically different. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's important that we, we consider every option. And if this is going to improve our state, we have a responsibility to consider it. Right. And uh, I, I have supported the provision that uh, would allow for renaissance zones around the state that would also include, uh, for example, um, uh, zones that uh, that uh, were right to work as well. Right. Okay. And we'll, we'll look at examples around the state to see if it, it has an impact, if it is, and if it's positive, it, it continued on that path. Exactly. Exactly. What in uh, right now? What is your typical day consisting of? Obviously, with a mix of being the Senate Majority Leader and campaigning. What's a typical day for you consisting of right now? Well, the, the most consistent day that I have right now is probably 90 percent budget and finding solutions for the uh, pending budget uh, uh, scenario. And uh, I would say about. Uh, we, we've got some reforms on the table as well, so I spend a lot of time uh, in my reforms committee looking for ways to deliver government service at a, at a less price and, and, and more efficiently. Okay, okay. Can you give everyone your uh, the website for your attorney general, uh, your campaign, so everyone can go check that out? Yes, I, I appreciate that. It, my um, my uh, website is pretty easy. It's mikebishop.com, and um, I... Uh, I've done the best I can to communicate with those that visit the site, and, and uh, I really think it's important that people get involved uh, in this Internet uh, networking process. It, we need to all connect, and we need to all talk. We need to share ideas and, and be a part of this. And I, I've even directed, and we've over time become extremely, I mean completely transparent in the Senate, where everything that we're proposing, everything that we're working on, you can see online now and uh, weigh in and talk about it and send us your thoughts. It's really a, a it's a really a neat opportunity for us in this day day and age to be able to to, to participate together. Definitely, uh, that that's that's the way I've pretty much been able to network and meet people like yourself is through uh, social networking. So I I definitely stand by that as a great way to uh, meet and greet and reach out to people. Um, on a on a lighter note here, I gotta gotta throw this in here. I did my research, saw you're a U of M guy. I'm a Spartan here. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to see, I wanted to feel how, how do how do you feel about the uh, how the direction of your football team is going? I just had to ask. Got to get that in there. Well, we've seen some lean times as of late. It's been an humbling experience to watch the the program uh, be challenged over the past couple of years. Uh, I, I think the next couple of years after, from, from here on out are going to be telling for the future of the program. I, I have confidence in the coach. I, I, I hope that they stick with him and see if he can pull this out. Okay, okay. And uh, one other thing I just wanted to tell you, I, I really, well, the first time I met you was at the uh, Mackinac Conference last year. And, uh, you know, the first one I asked you to, to describe yourself, the first thing you said was you were a family person. I just wanted to let you know that uh, that was one of the things I really noticed about you at the conference, that a lot of people were hobnobbing. You spent the most of your uh, time with your family, and I can really appreciate that. So I just wanted to let you know that that was one of the things that really impressed me while I was up at the Mackinac Conference. Well, that was something that was impressed upon me as a, as a child, and my family always made sure that they made that a priority. And I've got a a beautiful family, three beautiful kids, and a, and a wife who was incredibly um, gracious to, to, to let me do what I do and help with the family. And I'm, I'm blessed beyond anybody's uh, definition, and I don't take it for granted, that's for sure. Great, great. Well, Senator Bishop, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to come on the show. 
Um, we'll be we'll be following you, and I'm sure we'll have you back on again while you're uh, on the campaign trail. So thank you so much, and uh, God bless you. Thanks, Wayne. It's great to be here. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, that was my interview with uh, Mike Bishop, Senator Majority Leader here in Michigan. Uh, we got 10 minutes left in the show. If you want to call in, let me know uh, if you got any questions, 347-996-3175. Uh, give me a call. Let me know how you thought the interview with the uh, senator went or with the my other guest, David Oliviencia, the president of the Michigan Republican Hispanic Assembly. Uh, so give me a call, 347-996-3175. I want to hear what you have to say about the uh, how well we can do to fix Michigan. I'd like to hear your opinions possibly on, uh, the, on the uh, immigration issue. I'm sure if i got some national people out there listening, uh, there might be some opinions out there on that. So if you're interested in uh, voicing your opinion, give me a call, 347-996-3175. I want to hear from you. 347-996-3175. We only got about 10 minutes left on the show, so I would love to hear from you. Give me a call. Next next week's show, uh, uh, May 3rd, I believe, next week's show, I'll be having uh, Rick Snyder uh, on the show. Uh, he's gonna He's running for governor in Michigan. Uh, if you're not familiar with him, One Tough Nerd, look him up. He's the former uh, Gateway CEO, and he's going to be on the show. And he's going to give his vision of what he can do to uh, fix Michigan. So it should be an interesting show. Um, I've met uh, Mr. Snyder before, and it def- I'm definitely looking forward to the interview. Uh, May 17th, I believe, we're going to have uh, Congressman Pete Hoekstra on the show, who's also running for governor. So... Only we're, I'm waiting for Mike Cox camp to hopefully we can get them in on the 10th. But uh, after that, we will have interviewed all the candidates, uh, the top candidates for the GOP uh, for governor. And I plan on, at one point, uh, putting all those interviews on at, in one evening so you guys can really get a, a idea, you know, after listening to everyone who might be your uh, idea of the best candidate, who has the best vision to fix Michigan. So uh, I'm looking forward to some of the guests coming on over the next couple weeks. Uh, I did a meet and greet recently with uh, was also with Pete Hoekstra, and I can tell you that he's he's uh, quite the conservative candidate. So I'm looking forward to speaking with him. And uh, if you have any questions, give me a call three four seven nine nine six three one seven five. I'm going to go to the uh, chat boards also see what's going on out here. Uh, again, my personal feeling, if you if you wonder about how I feel about the immigration issue, is that it's quite obvious something needs to be done. Uh, you can't obviously, uh, you know, some people say, well, we, you know, basically start all over and send everybody, get everybody out the country and start from there. I don't think that's uh, realistic. Um, it's just too many people that have been here for, you know, we're talking two or three generations of people that might have been here illegally that have come here and made contributions to society. Now, again, you can argue about paying taxes and that sort of thing, but, uh the idea is that you cannot send, and, you know, it's going to be a, it'll be a tough sale to send a bunch of people back, um, back to you know their their original countries, and if they've been living here for ten to twenty years, and they've had kids that are natural American citizens, I just think that 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 is going to be pretty hard to do. Um, just knowing how things work here in America, it just seems that it seems like it would be possible to uh, financially make make these problems, you know, work these problems out in a way where uh, if, you've, if you've been living here for this a, long, a period of time, and you know, then you should pay, uh, quite simply. You know, you should pay back taxes. You should pay a, a, a fee, a penalty for being here illegally. Um, this is, it seems like, and if, you, and if you work for a company that has uh, employed you for the last, I don't know, five, ten years, uh, again, it, it should be a way financially, uh, which, again, would bring new revenue streams into this country that we so, so badly need without taxing people that, uh, you know, that, that didn't, you know, obviously they weren't part of that issue. So uh, from my standpoint, uh, knowing how America works in this capitalist society, uh, it seems like there's a financial way uh, to make this, uh, make this work out where, again, it seems that you can make people who are here illegally pay 
uh, make the companies that have employed them pay. Um, I, I think that, that that would, again, bring a large uh, financial uh, revenue stream in and also, again, keep families intact. You know, we're not trying to send grandpa back anywhere or anything like that. I think that's the problem that you're going to have now in uh, Arizona is that um, profiling is going to be even more prevalent now. Again, you know, a lot of people obviously voted for safer borders, but I just think that uh, the better way to do that would be to place a fence up there. Um, you can't systematically, you cannot leave it up to people to, uh, you know, better judgment to decide who is going to, who they're going to, um, Ask who's who is a legal resident or not. I mean, uh, that it just seems like you're opening yourself up to a lot of lawsuits, uh, which there will be a ton of frivolous lawsuits because there will be people that will be legitimately uh, pulled over and asked these questions, and and there's going to be people that are going to feel harassed that are American citizens, and I just think that that's asking for a lot more trouble than it's worth. Uh, I think again that, that calling on our leaders on both sides of the aisle. Uh, they're going to have to figure that out uh, because there's, there's no question that um, I wonder where the unions are at in all this now. You know, again, uh, the unions seem to only pick the battles that they directly uh, can benefit them. Uh, but I, it would seem to me that we'd all take that a little more seriously because uh, there's a lot of jobs out here that are being lost uh, possibly to uh, illegal immigrants because they're not paying taxes. I mean, the companies aren't paying payroll taxes. And it makes it hard for people who are actually trying to search for a job. Uh, it makes it a little more difficult for them. So I'm hoping that, again, calling on our government to work together to get that uh, situation done. Uh, and again, that's not just a, a Michigan issue. I believe that's a, that's a national issue in that, uh, again, if you leave this kind of thing open to debate, uh, you're going to find that each state is going to start instituting things that uh, just aren't, it's not going to work well to people. And, again, it's just... Uh, is asking for a certain amount of trouble. And again, uh, unless you know what it's like to be profiled and to, to be harassed, uh, you, it's not a good feeling. And I know that there's going to be a lot of people that, again, there's going to be some people that are some bad guys that you're going to definitely get off the streets, but you're going to end up ruffling the feathers of a lot of people that are honest, hardworking people. Um, and, to you know, again, basing it off looks, I think that's going to be a really... That's a really tough uh, way to decide or not if you're going to ask someone if they're a citizen of this country that they have their proper paperwork. I mean, you could have people here that don't speak good English, but they could be citizens. But it just leaves a lot, it leaves too much open to the uh, human mistakes and human errors and to, you know, bad decision making. So uh, I hope that our government steps up and, and does some things to make it a more uniform approach to uh, immigration reform because it's something that needs to be done. Um, it's just that uh, you can't have each state making up laws that, again, uh, the people of Arizona voted for it and they're comfortable with it. So that's, you know, again, that's their business, but it just, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get messy and it's going to leave people open to, um, you know, more lawsuits. Again, the state has suffered for that down the road for, for some of these decisions, so I don't know how badly they uh, are incorporating that into the decision-making process, but um, I, I just don't think that that was the best way to do that. Um, I, again, I support a fence. I think that's the best thing. To, that's that's where you start. Uh, I mean, you know, you can the people that are here already. That's a that's a totally separate issue. But uh, if you really want to improve our borders, you can make it real simple by starting with a fence. Uh, a fence that reaches across the whole, you know, all the way across the border. And, again, you're going to have people that are going to climb it, dig under it, and everything else because this is the greatest country in the world, and people do want to be here, and I can understand that. Um, and it's always been very supportive and uh, welcoming to immigrants, but it's about becoming a legal immigrant uh, that is going to make the difference. And I think that people need to understand that this, that this is another issue that's going to kind of get forced upon the table, and I uh, hope that uh, both sides don't make it just a strictly a political uh, a political fight and a, 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 a way to try to rescue in votes because it's really a deeper issue than that. Um, it's quite simple from the aspect of protecting borders and protecting our country, but uh, there are there are true human lives and families involved in this decision making. Uh, Michael Steele spoke on it earlier. Um, there are you know there are generations affected by decisions made in D.C. So 
Uh, Michael Steele said he plans on making a, a focus, the, you know, the focus on family and not just the statistics that show up on paper. I think that's the, the common sense, common sense approach, and I hope that he can reach out to uh, the leadership in the Senate, and the Congress, to the, for them to work together uh, to get something done because uh, the. The Republican Party does need to show that they are a party of answers and not just willing to fight on every issue. So um, I look forward to the next week's show. Uh, Wednesday, I'm going to have Pamela Atlas Gettler on the show. And uh, I'm going to be, like I said, we'll do Fix Michigan Monday next Monday. So thank you for listening, and good, good, good night, and God bless you. Bye-bye.